Well, as we were in Matthew chapter 10 last time, in verses 1 through 4, I want you to all remember that we had learned about the uniqueness of the 12 apostles, how they were unique spokesmen for Jesus Christ. Now today, in Matthew 10, verses 5 through 15, we're going to be learning how Jesus sent out his 12 to go preach the gospel to the lost tribes of Israel. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking really at three aspects of the apostles' mission. First of all, we're going to be answering the question, to whom were they to go? Who are they going to go and preach the gospel to? Well, we find that it was not to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but in Matthew 10, 6, we see it's to the lost sheep of Israel. That was their mission, first and foremost. Number two, we're going to answer the question, what will they say and do? And we find that the apostles are to preach the same gospel Christ does, and the gospel is about who Christ is and what he's done. And they're also to do the same miraculous deeds that he did to verify and to validate that they are his spokesmen. Number three, we're going to be answering the question, what about food and shelter? And here we're going to find out that Christ has ordained, foreordained, that indeed these apostles will be taken care of by believers who will give these men material support and they will give them provision. And so here the focus certainly is on the 12. But I think we have to realize that as we go out into our world, you and I are also equipped with the same gospel that these 12 men had. And the reason I say that is, notice the note here, the sending of the 12, I think, really foreshadows the sending of all believers, just as Matthew 28 is a great commission for all believers as well. Now, as I say that, I'm not claiming there's not a uniqueness to the 12. There is, but we will share in their mission. And so my point is, is whether it was Jesus Christ who first preached the gospel, or whether it was his 12, or whether it's us under apostolic authority in the year 2023, we have to know if someone will reject the message of the gospel, they will not enter the kingdom of God. But the same is true for those who will believe, whether it was when Jesus preached, the 12 preached, or when we preach, they will be saved. That's the significance of the apostolic word we now have because of their commissioning. Now, let's begin here in verses 5 through 6 where we see Jesus indeed sends the 12 out to reach the lost of Israel first. Notice it says, These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, first thing I want to point out here in the text is notice here, he's talking to the 12. And the 12 are those apostles that we looked at in depth last time. We looked at each of them individually. And, of course, there was only one of them that did not belong to Christ. That was Judas. Notice here it says Jesus sent them out. And recall, that's the verb apostello. You can hear the noun there for apostolos, which is the sent one. And I laid out in the last message that The concept in the New Testament is those who are sent, they have the authority of the one who sent them, namely the authority of Christ himself. Now, further in verse 5, we see Jesus give them limits as to where they were to go. Notice he says, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. Now, we're going to be answering the question. I have several points here to do so. Why is it that Jesus prohibited his disciples from first going to the Gentiles and the Samaritans? Why did he send them only to the Jews first? Well, many points I have to make here, but let me begin by showing you, first and foremost, this prohibition is not merely ethnic, but it is geographical. For example, where he says, go nowhere among the Gentiles, literally, it is a prohibition not to enter the road of the Gentiles. And I do think that that's exactly the point. It's just simply not to go to the Gentiles. But I want you to think about it. In Galilee, there really was a road that went to the north and east that would bring you to the Gentiles. And if you went south, you would end up entering the town, police, or city of the Samaritans. And so, yes, the prohibition is ethnic, but it's also geographical. The apostles were to limit their ministry within the confines of Galilee. And perhaps the reason why is remember, according to Isaiah chapter 9, the messianic light was first to dawn where? In Galilee. And the apostles were part of that messianic light. Why? Because they had the message of the Messiah upon their lips. And so, dear ones, we find out that it's not until after the rejection of Jesus Christ, 
after his perfect life, his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the sending of the Spirit, that indeed the apostles are to go to the Samaritans and they are to go to the ends of the earth to bring the gospel to the Gentiles as we find in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now, as I say that, I want you to remember thus far Jesus has already had a ministry to the Gentiles. And so Gentiles are not altogether excluded and they will in fact be grafted in. So think about it, as early as Matthew chapter 2, we saw Magi. And by the way, the Magi probably came from the area of Mesopotamia. I might talk about this on my Christmas message next week. These Magi came from Mesopotamia and they were the first, in a sense, to worship Christ. Think about Matthew chapter 4. Jesus has a ministry to those Gentiles in the Decapolis. Or think about Matthew chapter 8. Jesus had healed a Gentile Roman centurion, and so certainly there has been a Gentile mission. In fact, when we get to Matthew chapter 28, we're going to be about discipling all the nations. So Jesus isn't altogether excluding the Gentiles, but for now, notice Jesus says in verse 6, they were to rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember back in Matthew 9.36, Jesus had great compassion on the lost sheep of Israel. He said they were like sheep without a shepherd. Why? Because all of the shepherds, whether they were political leaders or religious leaders in Israel, had led the people into idolatry, had led them astray. But now Jesus is the good shepherd, and he's on the scene of history. Now, this still hasn't answered the question. And Notice I'm push, pushing it off a little bit here. Why is it that Jesus did not allow his disciples to go to the Gentiles and the Samaritans, but only to Israel, at least initially? Well, Jesus never specifically says, so we have to read between the lines, but let me give you the best case that I think we have based on the data that we have. I want you to remember that Jesus' gospel is inherently offensive to the sinful man and woman. And so for the Jews, they saw no need for a suffering Savior who would come and take away their sins. They didn't see a, a need for a Messiah who was to suffer, but rather they needed a Messiah in their minds who would come and conquer. And so if Jesus compounded the inherent offensiveness of the gospel with a mission priority to the Gentiles, that would have been even more offensive to the average Israelite. What Jesus endeavors to do is to limit any offense to the Israelites so that the offense is the gospel, not his mission to the Gentiles. I think that that's why he first and foremost goes to them. And so throughout the scriptures, we always see that there is a Jewish priority. The law goes to the Jews, but it condemns us as Gentiles. Think about in Romans 1.16, doesn't Paul say, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power unto salvation for all who believe, first for the Jew and also for the Gentile. He does say that. In fact, when Paul does his preaching in the book of Acts, he always begins in the synagogues, and as the Jews repudiate it, he moves on to the Gentiles. That's the priority of the Israelites as far as salvation is concerned. Remember, you and I as Gentile believers were grafted into their promises by faith in Christ, not the other way around. And so again, I think Jesus primarily is guarding the amount of offense of the gospel. If Jesus first went to the Gentiles, the Jews could say, well, we were offended because after all, he incorporated the Gentiles. No, the only offense that Jesus wanted for the Jews was the gospel. And there's something I think that can be learned there for all of us. You and I also want to limit any offense as we go out into the world. We want the offense to be not who we are, not our personalities, etc., but we also want the offense to be the gospel alone. Let people rise and fall on the gospel. Okay? So I think that's what Jesus was doing. Now, as we go on here, the next two verses, we see that indeed these apostles are going to carry the same doctrines and deeds as Christ did. Notice it says, Jesus keeps going, he says, And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without paying. Now, first of all, notice the priority here 
He wants them to proclaim, the term keruso there means to proclaim or to preach, what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, some of you may notice that conspicuously absent is the idea of repentance and faith. I think that's, that's implied. Okay, now you might say, hey, Eric, you're reading into that. Well, remember back in Matthew 3, 2, John the Baptist was one of the only fellow co-workers of Christ, and he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus, the other co-worker in the gospel at that time, Matthew 4, 17, said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the apostles are to have the same message. So I think implied is the preaching of repentance and faith. That's the idea. And by the way, in Mark 1.15, Mark 1.15 says this, that the time is fulfilled, Jesus said, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Okay, so that's a message that we see all through the scriptures. Now, one other point I want to make here is notice here the kingdom of heaven. Some will claim there's a distinction between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. That is a false distinction. They are synonymous. Some have claimed that the reason Matthew uses kingdom of heaven is because he was writing primarily to Jews who would have been offended by the usage of God's name. The problem with that is Matthew isn't always consistent. For example, when you get to Matthew 12, 28, Matthew will, in fact, use the very term, the kingdom of God. Okay. Another point that I want to make, and I'll get more into this in our application, is that people like Les Feldick, and by the way, Bob did a wonderful job in Sunday school pointing this out, Les Feldick will claim that there's a distinction between the gospel of the kingdom, which he would claim was only for the Jews, and a gospel of grace, which is for the church. That is also false. The gospel of the kingdom is the only gospel. It is, in fact, the gospel of grace. And so we'll talk about that more in our application. But notice here, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I'll talk more about this verb in our application as well, but I want to lay out the idea here when he says that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I don't think he's talking about geography, as if here we have the Messiah who's entered into the realm of man. I think primarily it's one of timing. And the idea that's conveyed throughout, not just here in the Gospels, but the New Testament, is that because of Jesus Christ's first advent, the blessings of the second advent are always at hand. And so this is a threat, of course, to those who don't believe, but it's an imminent blessing to those who do. Think of it this way. For those of you that know some of your biblical prophecy, the first coming of Christ ushers in the fulfillment of the end of the 69th week of Daniel. And so what you are then ushered into is the gap between the 69th week and what? The 70th week of Daniel. So in that way, in the first advent of Christ, the kingdom has drawn near. Because after the first advent, what do you have? You're going to have the second advent. That's how it's drawn near. It is at hand. All right, now, notice here then, we not only have the words they are to give, the preaching of the gospel, but notice here, there are deeds as well. Verse 8, he says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Now, I'm not claiming that as you and I go out today in the year 2023, that you and I don't see God heal. He certainly does, and we've seen it in our own midst. But what I am claiming is that these men were unique, that they had Christ's very authority so that they did the very miracles he did, so that we would know that these were indeed his authoritative spokesmen. So they do the same deeds in healing and even raising the dead. Now, notice to this, Jesus adds curiously, he says, you received without paying, give without paying. And what he meant simply by that is literally the term in Greek is dorian, it means gifts. You were given it as a gift, give it back as a gift. In other words, the disciples didn't do anything to earn this salvation. They weren't better people than anyone else. They freely were given salvation and even healing probably at the hands of Jesus. They were to freely bestow it. And brothers and sisters, I think there's a message for us. That should be us and our mindset as we go out the door as well. That we freely were given the gospel. We didn't do anything to deserve it. 
We weren't better than anyone else. It wasn't because our political views were more pure or because we were more righteous in any way. But we were freely given, and that's how our mindset should be, is that we freely give to others the gospel of grace. That we remember that we're sinners saved only by his grace and by his power, not by anything that we are. Now, as we continue on here, I think a natural question that the apostles would have had is, well, this kind of mission is certainly going to require some support monetarily and perhaps even with provisions. Well, Jesus gives them the answer to that now, verses 9 through 11. Notice he says, Acquire no, no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. Now, dear ones, notice here, they're to acquire no gold or silver. They're not to bring money or copious amounts of supplies. Why? Because here the disciples are going to learn to live out what they learned in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all of these other things will be added. Now they have to live that out. And so notice they're not to acquire all of these supplies, not gold, not a bag, not even two tunics. You'd think you'd bring an extra outfit along, but they're not even to bring that or sandals or a staff. Why? Well, he says a laborer deserves his food. And that, I believe, is an allusion back to Deuteronomy 25.4, where recall that the Israelites... If they had an ox that was treading out the grain, what was the ox doing? It was feeding people. So God ensured that you can't muzzle the ox that was treading out the grain. Well, the biblical writers oftentimes, in fact, Bob has shown us this in Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 9.9. 9, they will often allude to that to show a lesser to greater argument. If the lesser oxen who's feeding the people should be taken care of, how much more should the human preacher who's giving the people the food, the word of God, be taken care of? That's the argument. In fact, Paul makes that very argument in 1 Timothy 5.18. And so I think that that's the idea. Yes, the laborer of God certainly deserves to be taken care of. That's the idea. And so that's why he says, notice in verse 11, whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. Now, the term worthy there, axios, if you were to transliterate that into English, it's spelled just as it sounds, A-X-I-O-S. Axios is really the controlling adjective for the next few verses. And what we have to define is, what does Jesus mean by being worthy? Does he mean that some people are more righteous than others? Is he saying that there are some human beings that are better than others? Is that his point? No. What we find out is that being worthy, whether it's a town or a household, means these are those who both believe the gospel and receive the apostles. They believe and receive. They believe the gospel. Those who are worthy, they're the ones that the disciples will, in fact, be taken care of by. And so the reason I think Jesus may be saying, hey, stay there, until you depart, is he doesn't want the disciples all of a sudden to get into this game. Well, hey, Jim, he's got quite a buffet over there. He's got eggs and he's got waffles where Jerry, he's only got cold cereal. I think I'm going to be over it. No, I don't think that's the, what Jesus wants to happen. You stay with those who are worthy and you don't depart from there, hopping around from house to house. You stay with them until the mission is completed. And again, those who are worthy are those who believe the gospel and therefore receive, welcome, the apostles. That's the idea. So now, as we come to our verses here, the last ones of this little pericope, we learn of the absolute necessity for every single person to acquiesce to the doctrines of the apostles. That if we reject the apostles, that judgment will come upon us in the last day. Notice Jesus says, As you enter the house, greet it, and if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable 
on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Now, dear ones, notice here, he says, you come to a house, greet it. Remember, in the ancient Near East, travelers were completely dependent upon the hospitality of others, really in order to survive if they were traveling. There was no Motel 8 with Tom Bodell leaving the light on, right? So you had to rely upon the hospitality of your fellow uh, Israelite, especially for Israelites who were traveling amongst their own cities. Now, think about how much more were those considered worthy of being supported, those who were, in fact, being about God's business and preaching his word. That's the point. And so this greeting went both ways. It's not just the apostles greeting them, but they would have been given a greeting as well. Now, verse 13, notice he says, if the house is worthy, that's axios again. And again, how are they worthy? Is it because they're just better people? No, it's because they believe the gospel and they receive, therefore, the apostles. That makes them worthy. And so what were the apostles to do? They were not to allow their peace to depart. They were to let their peace come upon them. Now, this idea of peace in the ancient Near East often had to do with financial uh, giving and support. But here, I think peace has to primarily do with a spiritual peace. Remember, when we talk about peace here, we're not talking simply a peace between man where you don't have warfare between one tribe and another. But it's a peace in its most comprehensive sense. A complete peace where no longer will these Israelites who were enemies of God be enemies of God. They will be reconciled. They will have peace, not just with man, but with God himself. Why? Because the apostles' gospel is what bestows that peace. If someone will listen to their gospel and believe it, they will have peace with God. No longer enemies. Their sins will be forgiven and they'll have the absolute assurance of everlasting life. But if they're not worthy, they don't believe the peace of the apostles, and therefore the peace of Jesus Christ will not come upon them. They will always be enemies of God unless they repent later, and they will therefore suffer the very wrath of God. And so Jesus doubles down on this in verse 14. Notice he says, If anyone will not receive you, or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or that town. Dear ones, remember that pious Jews, when these pious Jews would leave Gentile territory and they would come back home to Israel, oftentimes they would take their sandals off and they would dust them out. And the image of that, the message they were conveying, is that they had no part with the Gentiles and that the Gentiles had no part with them. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Dust off your feet, you apostles, because these people have no part with you, and you have no part with them. The person who rejects the gospel, Jesus is saying is to be treated as the average Israelite would treat the far-off Gentile, the one who has no partaking in the kingdom of Israel. That's how they're to be treated. In fact, now he says, here's the coup de grace, Verse 15, he says, Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Sodom and Gomorrah are often used as exemplary judgments. We'll find that later on in Matthew chapter 24. We see it in Luke 17. Yes, Sodom and Gomorrah were cities that were judged because of their wickedness. And what Jesus is doing is he's doing a lesser to greater. Hey, if those Sodom... And Gomorrah residents were evil, even though they had a lesser light, they had lesser evidence. How much more guilty are those who have seen the messianic light dawn and they had the preaching of the gospel given to them by Christ's very apostles? He's saying, yes, they're even more culpable than those of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so those of Sodom and Gomorrah will fare much better on the judgment day than those who rejected Jesus Christ's words through the apostles. What that tells us, dear brothers and sisters, is that those who reject the apostolic word are rejecting Christ himself. That's what they're doing. So when you see a red-letter Christian saying, well, I don't really go for the words of Paul. I don't think that we have to listen to the words of Paul. I just go by the words of Jesus. No. If you reject the apostles, you're rejecting Christ and you're rejecting, therefore, God the Father. 
Dear ones, we can't think that way. We have to be those who know that the apostles gives us the very words of Christ. Okay, so with that, let's come to some applications from this text. I have three of them for you here this morning. Number one, we must know that Christ's coming is imminent. Ever since the first advent of Christ, it is ushered near or to be at hand the second advent. And we have to, I think, as a church, not just here locally, but broadly speaking, recover the doctrine of imminence. And I want to talk about that. Number two, we should understand there is only one gospel. There isn't a gospel of the kingdom and a gospel of grace. One for the Jews and one for the Gentiles, there's only one. And that's the gospel that was on the lips of the apostles. Number three, we must know that judgment will come to all who reject the apostolic word. The apostles' word is not optional. We are all governed and bound by every word they said. Okay, so let's begin with number one. Today, we witness Jesus commissioning his apostles to preach that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Remember, we saw that in Matthew 10, 7. Notice they were to proclaim as they were going that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Now, notice the verb here, at hand. It's a act, perfect active indicative of engizo. And I think the significance of that is it has to do with Jesus' first coming ushering in the imminence of his second coming, ushering in the imminence of what will occur when, in fact, he returns a second time. And so think about in Jesus' life, his perfect life, his life, his teaching, his preaching, his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the subsequent sending of the Spirit. Think of that as being all signified by the cross here on my timeline. That's the first coming. What happens is that ushers in the last days. When will Christ return? Well, it's going to happen in the last days. So at some point, we're going to come to this parousia. I've laid out, I think, seven different messages in my eschatology class that the parousia is synonymous with the 70th week of Daniel. It is a complex event. And so the parousia, as soon as Jesus finishes his first advent, it is now at hand. Why? Because we're living in the last days. Now, how do we know that we're living in the last days? Well, think about Hebrews 1, 1 through 2. The writer of Hebrews says, in the, in the past, in many portions, in many ways, God has spoken to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through the Son. So as Jesus is engaged in ministry at his first coming, he knows that that's ushering in what? The last days. So the next event on God's redemptive calendar is what? It's the parousia. The parousia has drawn near. The term parousia is a noun that really serves as a technical term for the second coming of Christ. In fact, let me show you. This is Jesus' brother. Oh, by the way, what happens after the parousia? You get the millennium. You get the millennial kingdom, and then on from there, the eternal states. Notice here what Jesus' brother said, James 5.8. He said, you too be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. First thing I want you to know, the term coming there is the term parousia. That's what that term is. That's right here. That's the 70th week of Daniel. That is, in fact, what? It's near. The term near there is ingitso, the identical verb that you see here being used in Matthew 10, 7. In fact, it's also a perfect active indicative. The parousia is at hand. Why? Because we're living in the last days. Now, how long are these last days going to last? Well, you don't know. How near is this parousia? Is it one day, one week, one month, one year, a hundred years? You don't know. It is perpetually at hand until it breaks forth. And Jesus knows that his first advent is bringing this near. That's the idea. And the nearness, then, is to give comfort to those who believe but it's also to invigorate us and the apostles first to what? Preach the gospel. Why? Because this kingdom is at hand. It's to invigorate us. Brothers and sisters, that's why we should be invigorated about the imminence of this coming king and kingdom. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews 9.28. Please turn your Bibles to Hebrews 9.28. I want you to see this passage. We often don't think of Hebrews as being an eschatological book, and that's certainly true. But Hebrews 9.28 shows us a very important distinction between the first and second advent and how the New Testament writers conceived of the two different advents. 
Hebrews 9.28, notice what it says. The writer of Hebrews says, So Christ, having been offered once, I think, by the way, the term there is hapax, if I remember, meaning once and never again. So he was offered once to bear the sins of many. He will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So go on to the timeline here. What the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, the first advent was about him saving us from our sins, but he's coming a second time to save us from the wrath of God, to spare us and to give us this glorious kingdom. There's two different comings, not three, not four, there's two. The first, he puts away sin. The second time, he's coming to save us. And so one of the, the doctrines that I think has largely been lost on evangelicalism today that I'd like to see recovered is this doctrine of imminence. And the reason why I think it's been lost by and large in the church today is because, number one, unbelief, but number two, muddied thinking as to what imminence is. Let me explain why the coming of Christ is imminent. You need two things to be true, two criteria for an event to be imminent. The first thing that you need is an event that is certain to happen. Do we have that with the parousia, the coming of Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely we do. In fact, you see that in Matthew 24, 35. Jesus says regarding his parousia, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words never will. What is he saying there in Matthew 24, 35? He's talking about certainty. His parousia is a certain event. There is a 100% chance of the parousia occurring. That's the first thing you need for an imminent event. The second thing you need is the unknowability as to the date of that event. We have that in the very next verse in Matthew 24, 36. Jesus says, no one knows. Concerning the day or the hour, you have no idea. So as Jesus brings forth his first coming and therefore the last days, how close to the parousia are you? One day, one year, a hundred years, one hour, you have no idea but it's certain to occur. That's the doctrine of imminence. And one of the errors that I often hear people making is they'll say, well, come on, Eric, you believe in imminence, and yet it's been 2,000 years since Christ went to heaven. That is a fallacy. The fallacy that they are making is they believe imminence means it has to happen within a certain time frame. Er, that is wrong. An imminent event doesn't have to happen within a certain time frame, but it can happen at any moment. Let me say that again. An imminent event does not have to occur within any certain time frame, but it can happen at any moment. That's the doctrine of imminence. And so we see it all over the New Testament. You saw it today that Jesus Christ knew that with the first coming, his first advent, that coming kingdom had drawn near in time. You see it in the book of Revelation. The whole book of Revelation is built on the doctrine of imminence. Look at Revelation 1.3. John wrote, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. The time there, Kairos, is the significant redemptive moment on the calendar, as it were. And notice the term near. That's the adverbial form of the verb that we saw today of ingitso. It's ingus. It's drawn near. Well, how near? Well, you don't know. Now, why would he say this, for the time is near? Because the core of the book of Revelation, chapters 6 through 19, those 14 verses are about these seven years, about the parousia. And what is it? It's near. Notice what it says at the end of the book, Revelation 22.10. Here, John is given instructions. He said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Same adverb, ingus, built off of the same verb that we saw in Matthew 10.7 today. Well, how in years? Is it one day, one year, a thousand years? You have no idea. Because why? We're in the last days. It's always at hand. So when Jesus said today that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that was the message of the apostles. Well, that's our message too. Why? Because we're those who live in the last days. Why? Because Christ came the first time. That's the logic of what the Bible is teaching you. Did Jesus Christ's first coming usher in the last days? Yes. When do the last days end? You have no idea. There's imminence. There you have it. Let me show you again, lest we don't see the big picture here in Revelation. Notice Revelation 1.1 1, 1 says the same thing. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon, tacos, 
take place. How soon? You don't know. One day, one year, uh, one hour, you have no idea. Notice Revelation 22, 6. The God of the spirits of the prophets sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must taco soon take place. Well, how soon? We don't know. Brothers and sisters, the grand point is this was the urgency that the apostles were given as they were sent out preaching. And if the apostles were given that urgency to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand, why do we at the church 2,000 years later say, well, we don't need that urgency? We do need that urgency. That's the urgency that should be on the hearts and the minds of every believer. Why? Because this coming king and his kingdom is an imminent blessing to those who believe, but it also is an imminent threat for those who do not. And that's the urgency that we should all have as we go out the door in our preaching of the gospel, in our boldness, and our love for the lost. Okay, now let's go on to our second point, and that is there's only one gospel. Remember, Jesus said in John, or excuse me, not John, Matthew 4, 17, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the same message that the apostles were sent out with that they had the message of the gospel upon their lips. And yet, today, we see hyper-dispensationalists like Les Feldick. He's, by the way, off the scene of history. He died. But hyper-dispensationalists will claim that the gospel of the kingdom that the apostles were preaching was for the Jews, but there's a gospel of grace that's for the church. And so what they'll do is they'll read into Matthew 10 that we read today. We'll say, they'll say that gospel... The gospel of the kingdom is for the Jews. It's not for any of the believers today. And so the gospels, whether they be Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, that was for the Jews, but they don't apply to the church today. That's nonsense. And we have to know that. No, there's always been just one gospel. Now, Bob has written a great article years ago. It's volume 108 from Critical Issues Commentary, where he refutes these ideas from Les Feldick. But let me get into a couple of issues that Les Feldick raises, and we'll turn to some verses here. Les Feldick will claim that, again, the Gospels were for the Jews. They're not for the church. It's not for us. When we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're deceiving ourselves. That was for the Jewish nation. It's not for us. Well, turn your Bibles, if you will, to Luke 1, verses 3 through 4. Luke chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, and let's see who Luke was writing to. Luke 1, verses 3 through 4. A good way to refute this. Luke chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Notice here, Luke himself says this. He said regarding his writing, It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Well, notice who was Luke writing to. He was writing to Theophilus, a Gentile. Now, isn't it interesting? Les Feldick says that the Gospels, including the Gospel of Luke, was written to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. You have to ask yourself the question, are you going to believe Luke, the author, or Les Feldick, the teacher? I'm going with Luke. Les Feldick said that repentance is not a part of the Gospel for us Gentiles. So that is really a work that's relegated to the gospel of the kingdom for the Jews. That's not true. Turn your Bibles to Acts 26.20. Acts 26.20. Let's look at the Apostle Paul and what he proclaimed. Acts 26, verse 20. Notice what Paul says here. Acts 26.20. Hope you've all turned there. Sorry, I'm fighting with my computer a little bit here. I think it's winning, too. Notice here, Acts 26, 20, it says, But he declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with the repentance. Dear ones, that's the same message that John the Baptist had, and Jesus had, and the apostles had in the Gospels. The truth of the matter is there's always only been one gospel. And yes, it is a gospel of grace, and it is a gospel of the kingdom. For without believing it, you will not enter it. And so that's why the Apostle Paul would say in Galatians 1, 8 through 9, he said very succinctly, but even if we 
or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Stop there for a moment. Notice a curse that's anathema. Literally, it's a curse of hell. If anyone has a different gospel, they're cursed of hell. Verse 9, he says, As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Again, anathema, cursed of hell. Brothers and sisters, the gospel that we are proclaiming, the same gospel that Jesus proclaimed, John the Baptist proclaimed, that the apostles proclaimed, is about the person and work of Jesus of Nazareth. That's the good news. The good news is about who Jesus is and what he has done and what he's going to do. It's about the person and work of Jesus Christ. The gospel is not about who we are. We're part of the bad news. Now, why do I say that? I hear oftentimes Christians will give a testimony. It ends up being about them. No, we're not the good news. The good news of the gospel is about the person and the work of Christ. It's not about our past lives. It's not about trying to save the planet from climate change. It's not about trying to bring a political kingdom through human effort. It's about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And there will only be this one gospel. So, dear ones, today I have the privilege of giving you the gospel, the good news. But I always tell people the good news only makes sense, really, if you understand the bad news. And see, the apostolic word reveals both. You see, the bad news is very bad indeed when we consider the fact that all of us have sinned and rebelled against God in thought, word, and deed. That's what Romans 3.23 is stating. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the news gets even worse when we consider the fact that in Romans 6.23, the wages of this sin, this rebellion that we have, is death. Not just a physical death, that's bad enough, but also one day an eternal separation from God in the lake of fire as the apostles promised and Jesus himself promised. Now that's bad. I can't think of any worse news. That you and I are cosmic rebels against the Holy One of Israel in thought, word, and deed and that we deserve the wrath of God forever. That's terrible news. But that's precisely where the good news shines. The good news of the gospel, the one gospel, is that God sent forth the Son. The Son who existed as God and with God from all eternity at a point in time in history, through a virgin birth, he became a man so that he was truly God and truly man in one person so that he could live the perfect life that none of us could so that by faith in him, his righteousness could be credited to our account. But this Jesus didn't simply live the perfect life. He also died a substitutionary death. Jesus the just on behalf of us the unjust in order that we might be brought to God. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he took upon himself the full measure of God's wrath that we deserve to be punished with, and he paid it off. That is for those who believe so that you and I can have forgiveness of sins, that we could go free, and we can have the absolute assurance of everlasting life in this glorious kingdom. Dear ones, the proof that Jesus accomplished this was seen by the fact that on the third day after his bodily death, he was bodily raised from the dead. Remember, Jesus asked his disciples, does a spirit have flesh and bone as I clearly have? He was physically raised. He physically ascended to the heavens where he's seated at the right hand of God from where he's coming again to bring this glorious kingdom which is imminent. Therefore, what should every person do? Well, Jesus and his apostles don't give us helpful hints. They give us the command that we should repent and believe the gospel. The repentance has to do with a change of mind, metonoeo, but therefore a change in the direction of our whole being, that we would turn from sin and idolatry and we would turn to the, from those things to God on his terms, which is faith alone in Christ alone. Today, if you will trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ under the authority of the apostolic word, we can declare to you, not because we've said it, but because God did, that you have the forgiveness of sins and the absolute assurance of everlasting life. And yes, it absolutely is a free gift. All right, now, with that, let me come to the final point and that is that the apostolic word must not be rejected. Jesus said today in Matthew 10, 15, 
that it would be more bearable on the day of judgment for those in Sodom and Gomorrah than it would be for those who rejected the apostles' message. So yes, the apostles' message, the word of God that we have in the scriptures, it is not optional. Every single human being must submit to it and bow their knee either now or they will later. Many years ago, I had left the airline industry, and my whole life was really dedicated around aviation. I became a believer later in life. And I remember I went to seminary in 2005 at Bethel Seminary, and I felt much like a fish out of water. I was around a bunch of professors who were really attacking the apostolic word. And at Bethel, the way they attacked it was they were saying to me, Eric, you just don't understand epistemology. You don't understand, by the way, epistemology is the study of knowledge. How do we know what we know? And what they were doing is they were trying to take the apostolic word away by saying you can never come to a true interpretation of it. You can never really know it. Bob talked about that today in his Sunday school. He calls them the little engines that can't. I think I can't know. I think I can't know. I can't know. And then <laughs> Bob talked about how the fact that they say they can't know, then they write a book about how they can't know, and they hold you accountable for knowing it. That's the deep irony of it. But I felt like a fish out of water. The very doctrines that I had trusted for my salvation were being yanked from me because of this epistemology. And so I'll never forget, I had a real quandary in my mind. I wasn't a trained theologian. I was an airline pilot. For year after year, I was pulling gear up and putting gear down. That was my job. I was flying airplanes, so I didn't have the epistemological and theological acumen. But I knew this one thing. In 1 John 5.13, John the Apostle said, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have everlasting life. And being a logical thinker, I knew that you couldn't know and not know at the same time and in the same relationship. Brothers and sisters, the apostles are saying you can know, and in fact, you must know. And that's how I met Bob DeWay. Bob DeWay came, and he was the one who intellectually could kick down the front door of the postmodern and defeat them in their own game. And I'm for eternally grateful to Bob for this. I'll never forget he gave a message at Northwestern College, and this is the text that he put up as he refuted postmodernity. He put up the words that came from the apostles, from Jesus Christ, written down by the apostle John. Notice it says in John 12, 48 through 49, Jesus said, The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Stop there. How could Jesus say that this word will be our judge on the last day if we can't know it? Well, of course, we can know it, and we're on the hook for knowing it. That's the point. That's the power of the apostolic word. Notice in verse 49, Jesus went on. He said, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. Remember, Jesus is the original apostolos, the original sent one from the Father, but he, in fact, has deputies. He deputized these 12, and they went out, and they carried his very words because they were his sent ones. And now that those 12 are off the scene of history, you and I, when we go out the door today, if we accurately convey what these scriptures say, we're giving apostolic authority. Not that we are apostles ourselves, but we're under their authority. Brothers and sisters, it's incumbent upon every single human being to bend their knee and to believe and to understand the apostolic word. Let us be those who have that confidence as we go out the door today that as long as we're reflecting what the apostles of Jesus Christ have said, we're under the very authority of Christ. That is the good news that you have as you go out the door. You can go out with great boldness and great compassion, knowing that the words that you give can bring people into the kingdom of heaven. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you that you've given us this apostolic word, that we can know it for salvation, that we can know what pleases you and what displeases you. We can know what's binding and loosing. We can know truth from error. And Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you've not left us in darkness, but with an objective standard that has once and for all been laid down to us saints. We thank you for that, Lord. I do thank you for my dear brothers and sisters here who do preach the gospel, who have it upon their lips, who contend for the faith. 
I do pray, Lord, that you would give us boldness. And in this season, we pray that you'd give us ample opportunity to give your gospel to loved ones, to those at our work, family members, friends across the fence who may not know you so that they would hear the good news of the kingdom of heaven and that it is at hand. We pray that you put the gospel upon our lips and give us the ability to live lives that are pleasing to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.